Good afternoon. I am the MC of the third day of the 2021 KSB Dissemination Conference. It is my pleasure to say hello once again. Following the past two days, I would like to thank you for joining us on the third day of the event. This forum is being held under the theme of navigating green and digital transformation through knowledge sharing. It has been held for the past three days, starting from September 28th. We have invited various experts from diverse fields under this appropriate and timely topic. And on this third day, we will be hosting the 2021 KSP Business Forum. And this is being hosted by the Ministry of Economy and Finance and organized by COTRA, Korea Exim Bank, and KDI. Because of COVID-19, we have not been able to invite every one of you, but we would like to ask you to join us until the very end through our online YouTube channel. First, I would like to invite uh, for the opening remarks Director Chang Ui Soon of the International Economic Cooperation Strategy Division of the Ministry of Economy and Finance, a big Round of applause. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to meet you all. I am Chang Ui Soon, Director in Charge of the KSP at the Ministry of Economy and Finance. Welcome to the KSP dissemination and follow up project linkage forum the third day event of today of this year's KSP dissemination conference in particular I extend my gratitude to mr. Yi Sang Ho head of the EDCF coordination group of the export import Bank of Korea and mr. Park Chor Ho the director general of development cooperation department of the Korea trade investment promotion agency for your presence today and your efforts in organizing this forum. My thanks also go to the speakers who are here to attend the Braytac sessions in person or join us online at home and abroad. This week is very meaningful for the KSP. In addition to the dissemination conference held from Tuesday, the KSP advancement strategy was announced at the ministerial meeting on international economic affairs held on Monday. The strategy outlines ways to cope with environmental changes, such as change in partner countries' demand for policy advice, and to grow the KSP into a representative knowledge cooperation program globally as well as in Korea. While the KSP advancement strategy contains a variety of improvement plans, the gist of the strategy can be summarized in one sentence, which is, KSP aims to derive specific results that partner countries intend to achieve. Recently, partner countries are looking for one-stop services that go beyond simple knowledge sharing and provide a wide range of services from policy advice to concrete commercialization opportunities. Let me share an example. In 2018, the KSP provided policy recommendations to Kenya for the policy recommendation for capacity development for production and management of digital media content at Konza Technopolis. To follow up on the project, the Korea uh, Exim Bank conducted a feasibility study on commercialization, and the KSP offered further advice on content development and management for the digital media city. We're currently carrying out an economic innovation partnership program through which we will explore business opportunities for Korean businesses. In order for the KSP to continue to create concrete business opportunities linked to KSP projects, constant interest and participation of business leaders at home and abroad is essential. I am confident that this forum, jointly organized by the Export-Import Bank of Korea and the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency, will be a meaningful venue to hear from officials from the Asia Development Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, who will speak about how to identify project opportunities and to share key KSP projects with local and global business leaders. Furthermore, the Q&A sessions will provide a great opportunity for you to develop new cooperation projects distinguished guests and attendees joining us virtually. It's regret regrettable that we are unable to meet in person at on-site booths due to the COVID pandemic. 
However, we have extensive, made extensive efforts to ensure active participation and seamless communication uh, by extending the duration of the Q&A sessions. So I look forward to your active participation. In closing, I express my deepest gratitude once again to all of the officials involved in the KSP and business leaders who have shown keen interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director, for the opening remarks. This week is a very meaningful week for the KSP. And for the past three days, I do hope that you have enjoyed an informative uh, experience. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Yi Sang Ho, who is the head of the EDCF Coordination Group of the Export Import Bank of Korea. He will deliver his welcome remarks. Please greet him with a big hand. Good afternoon. I am Yi Sang Ho, the head of the EDCF Coordination Group of the Export Import Bank of Korea. First, Director Chang Yoo Soon of the International Economic Cooperation Strategy Division of the Ministry of Economy and Finance, Director General Park Cho of the Development Cooperation Office of COTRA, and all the members of the KSP institutions, the businessmen and members from NDBs, as well as those from home and abroad joining us online. Thank you very much. It is a meaningful opportunity for me to deliver the congratulatory remarks at the KSP Business Forum, which is taking place on the third day of the KSP Dissemination Conference. As it was mentioned by Director Chang Bisun last Monday, the Korean government announced a strategy to reinforce KSP during the ministerial meeting on international economic affairs, and various implementation measures were established to expand KSP quantitatively and qualitatively and further disseminate KSP outcomes and link KSP with follow-up projects. As this year's seminar has been extended to three days in this light, I hope that the KSP can advance one step further through the seminar and help partner nations lay the foundation for greater competency and independence while strengthening links with follow-up projects, such as those involving Korean companies' entrance into partner country markets. Today's KSP Business Forum will be held with two parallel sessions, one led by the Korea Exim Bank and the other by COTRA. In relation to the KSP follow-up project strategies, I look forward to hearing views on utilization of technology cooperation programs and project identification strategies, especially from the ADB, IDB, and Korea Exim Bank. In particular, MDBs identify and source projects utilizing their networks with regional partner countries and their expertise in various sectors. They also have abundant experience in operating technology cooperation programs, so I do believe that great insight will be provided in regard cards to KSP follow-up projects. I hope that this forum can be used by the businessmen as a stepping stones for identifying new overseas projects and that the feedback exchanged with the businessmen can help KSP further advance in the future. Recently, in Korea's development cooperation field, the need to converge ODA loans and grants have been emphasized to ensure the consistency in government funding and effectiveness of ODAs. In response, multi-faceted efforts will be made to have the KSP be aligned with ODA loans or grant programs. ADCF is Korea's ODA loan program for helping Korean companies advance into partner nations. By promoting its alignment with KSP, we look forward to obtaining meaningful business outcomes such as expanded EDCF approvals. Furthermore, Areas for cooperation between KSP and Korean grant organizations that have expertise in sectors such as healthcare, digital, and the environment will also be looked into. Through this forum, I hope that future development strategies of KSP can be specified and in-depth reviews on ways for businesses to venture into partner countries take place. I look forward to KSP, Korea's leading knowledge sharing program, advance further and become a more sustainable and meaningful ODA program. And with this, I would like to conclude my congratulatory remarks. Thank you very much.
Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Lee Sang Ho, head of the EDCF Group of Korea Exim Bank. Now I would like to invite Director General Park Cho Ro of the Development Coordination Office of COTRA to deliver his welcome remarks. Good afternoon. I am Park Cho Ro, Director General of the Development Cooperation Office at COTRA. I would first like to take this opportunity to thank all of our guests, our participants, especially viewers who are joining us virtually. Thank you. Also, I would like to extend my gratitude to Mr. Tang Yi-soon of the Ministry of Economy and Finance for planning and organizing today's forum, as well as Mr. Yi Sang-ho, head of the EDCF Coordination Group at Export Import Bank Korea. Alongside the Exim, uh, Export Import Banks of Korea, COTRA has hosted the KSP since 2014. And COTRA has not only provided policy consultation, but has also used its unique expertise and directly linked it with business opportunities and endeavored to forge sustainable cooperation ties between Korean businesses and partner countries. For example, after the KSP on the modernization of the shipbuilding capabilities in Peru, the KSP was linked to actual business opportunities as a trade expo was hosted for local businesses and Korean shipbuilding ma machinery manufacturers. We are also supporting our businesses so that they may take part in a follow-up naval compound relocation project. KSP projects serve as a fantastic tool for our businesses to gain a foothold in the global market. They help partner countries to improve their current systems, creating a favorable business environment for Korean businesses, and also provide an opportunity to identify beforehand the goods and services that partner countries need. By uncovering prospective projects, for Korean businesses, particularly in areas in which we have a competitive edge, such as IT, industrial infrastructure, urban development, and healthcare, and by creating concrete businesses as a result, we will be able to build a win-win business platform that benefits both the partner country and our businesses. In order to enhance the effectiveness of K the KSP, COTRA has listened to the views of various clients and experts. And in this process, we learned that a key problem faced by clients was lack of information on development cooperation programs. And so today's forum has been organized to meet this demand. In today's forum, we have prepared presentations on local SOC and infrastructure projects that will be of particular interest to Korean businesses. The presentations will introduce ongoing or prospective projects pursued by partner countries. And we will also share information on the local situation and future plans of partner countries as surveyed by our researchers. We hope that today's forum will be of help to the Korean businesses wishing to expand their markets overseas as you forge your business strategies. Distinguished guests, participants joining us online, once again, I would like to thank you for taking part in today's event despite the challenging circumstances. If you have any inquiries, please make use of the Q&A time allocated in each session. And also, feel free to contact us if you have knowledge of any feasible projects or cooperation opportunities for our businesses. Thank you very much. KSP, Knowledge Sharing Program, is a platform to share Korea's development experience with partner countries. 
Korea has accumulated experiences in diverse policy areas throughout its development stages. Korea's experience has become the main asset of KSP. To deliver practical know-how to our partners, KSP invites people with first-hand experience on Korea's transformation. KSP is managed by the Ministry of Economy and Finance and specific projects are undertaken by organizations with the related expertise. In order to produce practical solutions, KSP starts with mutual learning. KSP invites local policymakers to be part of the initiative. Throughout the entire program, Korean experts and local consultants work hand in hand. Knowledge sharing and interactions become strong foundations for turning potential into real capacities. KSP can deliver not only solutions for institution building, but also operational knowledge needed to tackle the challenges of our partners together. Final results are delivered to key decision makers so that KSP can act as a bridge between policy practitioners and policy makers. KSP's focus on practicality was answered by the increasing number of partner countries. KSP's impact goes far beyond policy recommendations. KSP leads to tangible results including legal frameworks, roadmaps, and new institutions. Moreover, KSP opens up a new horizon for international cooperation. By hosting investment forums or business dialogues, KSP is making significant contributions in private sector development. KSP strives for sustainable development of our partners by implementing EDCF or export finance to support infrastructure development. KSP is widely acclaimed within the international community as an effective platform for knowledge sharing. KSP is conducting various cooperation projects with international organizations. Grow together with knowledge. Start with KSP. The topic of the session is follow-up projects and future development strategies of KSP. In this parallel session, we have three presentations prepared. I would like to invite the first presenter. The first presentation is on TATCs by the ADB, uh, the KSP cooperation. And we have Wu uh, yong gun who will be joining us online. And he will be discussing the ADB in alignment with loan programs and projects. And after that, we're going to have a Q&A session. Please welcome him with a big hand. Hello. As was introduced, I am uh, Yonggun Oh from the um, Asian Development Bank. It's a pleasure to meet you. This is a, a virtual presentation, so it may not feel so real. I'm not exactly sure whether you can hear me well. Can you hear me well? Okay. Now that... Uh, Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. I think uh, it's working okay. Yes, so um, it's a pleasure to meet you. So I'd like to uh, thank the host for organizing this conference, Dr. Sang Ho Lee of KXM and also a relevant officials of the Ministry of Economy and Finance. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to um, deliver my, my presentation as effective as possible. Uh, this presentation is not going to be so interesting. Uh, it's going to be very technical. 
So I'd like to um, ask for your understanding in advance. Uh, we use English as an official language, and I'm not exactly sure uh, the audience is sitting over there, but I think uh, most of the people that are sitting over there in the audience are probably Korean. So I think I'm just going to be delivering my presentation in Korean. So the presentation is titled Technical Assistance and Cooperation in the um, ADB Operations. So I would like to first uh, talk about the um, definition of uh, technical assistance. Uh, when I was working at the um, KXM, when I first heard the term technical assistance, I wasn't exactly sure what that really meant. So let's now delve into the, uh, the term, what technical assistance means or technical cooperation means. Well, it's translated as 기술 협력 or technical assistance or cooperation. So it's a professional level or a technical a level of assistance that requires a professional level, a very specialized a level of assistance than a general a level of assistance. So this is the uh, table of contents uh, for my presentation. What I will be talking about throughout my presentation, some of the useful questions concerning TA that's available at the um, ADB. So what are the routes that are available and when the TA becomes official? And when we implement a TA, what are the guidelines are to be followed? What are the processes that we have to follow? Who are the stakeholders involved? What are their roles, responsibilities? Last but not least, what are the ex post evaluations? Why do we have to perform such evaluations? They're all related with one another in a way. So I will be dealing with them one by one. So TA uh, from the point of um, ADB. This is very similar to what KSP, uh, how that is uh, structured. For example, when you're preparing a project or when you're, for example, preparing a project uh, for capacity building in a developing country or doing a research and development in a partner country or providing a, a policy consultation. That is another type of a technical assistance. that is customized uh, to a certain needs uh, in a develop, uh, developing country and that is linked to specific needs of a developing country. In the past, uh, the ADB used to offer different types of TAs. For example, a project proprietary TA or capacity development TA, or, which is a CDTA or policy and advisory TA, research and development TA, and different types of uh, TAs were available, uh, RITA and SSTA. So they were broken down into different categories, but they were very confusing. So there was a need to simplify them, unify them. So. They're now uh, merged into two big categories, TRTA and KSTA. So it may seem a bit uh, misleading, but for example, if policy and advisory TAs, anything that is related to project policies, project proprietary TAs, are not exactly translated into TRTA, although they're uh, put together, uh, put next to uh, TRTA. So what is the scale and the size of the technical assistance at ADB, the commitment size, just in general? Uh, this is the uh, size of approved amount on an annual basis, the bottom from 2016 through to 2020. At a minimum level, 181 million to 294 million at a maximum. The, there isn't specific trend here. 
but it's in the um, order of about 200 million. That is an annual approved commitment for TA, and significant portion of that is a sovereign portion. Uh, that's an, an EDCF. And there are also non-sovereign uh, advisory, for example, project financing or PPP, technical assistance, especially when there's a lack of capacity uh, coming from implementing agencies. That is about 10 million or 20 million non-sovereign uh, TAs that are provided. As for, I, I understand that there could be a lot of um, interest in TA commitments for ADB because there are a lot of funds that are established for supporting TAs at ADBs. As for the TA financing facilities, there are replenishment programs every four years. There are contributions made by member countries and ADBs. Uh, fund their own programs from their operational programs, from their net income, their allocatable net income. That's discretionary funds. They're to be allocated to the TA funds. That's about $200 million, uh, which is to be maintained on an annual basis. So that's coming from their own operations. So how is ADB uh, utilizing the TA from a strategic point of view? KSP is um, also taking a strategic viewpoint in implementing TA because uh, the resources are always um, limited, so they're always stretched. So you have to set your priorities right. And it is always true for any um, any programs. So in utilizing TAs at ADB, we always uh, take into consideration the fit alignment. So what do we mean by alignment? Alignment with what? First, alignment with country program goals of that partner country. We um, call it the country partnership strategy of the DMC. And the sub-level output, uh, which is the country operations business plan, which I will explain uh, later in my presentation. So CPS and COBP which really emphasizes the ownership of the DMC. I will explain this later, but basically these strategies really require strong commitment from the DMC. And ADB is there to provide support so that the DMC can really do a good job. And TA can play a certain role in that. And then the next alignment has to take place with the corporate goal. So first alignment with the country program goal and the second alignment with the ADB corporate goal. So there are two alignments, one with the uh, DMC and the other one with the um, ADB. So at a donor level as well as the recipient level because ADB is receiving contributions from different stakeholders, the stakeholders or the shareholders and their needs and expectations from their member countries. So these two elements have to be taken into equation. And last but not least, even if we have full alignment with these goals, we have to be very mindful of the outcomes. 
we have to ensure the effectiveness in the process. So ex post evaluation is critical. So the department that has implemented uh, the TA, the department will be conducting the evaluation. And another independent department that was outside the process will be asked to conduct the evaluation. And it will be reported to the uh, stakeholder. And the results will also be made, uh, it will be disclosed to the general public as well. So there will be self-evaluation and also an independent evaluation. So this slide shows a project cycle. Any um, MDB is doing this, uh, not just an ADB. This is a very generic uh, pro project cycle that is followed. You first come up with a, a plan, and then you have a preparation process. And once you get it done correctly, then you go through an internal clearance approval process. Then you go through execution implementation process. Then you do evaluation. Then you start the process again. You It's a feedback process. You go back to the uh, country partnership strategy. So you get you go back to the front end of the process. So the TA uh, process begins somewhere in between the country partnership strategy. And once you're done with this, Well, it's it, it's some it begins somewhere between the preparation and the country partnership strategy. And you're trying to put another uh, circle in between the country partnership strategy and preparation um, stage. This is where the TA will step in. And if you're interested in learning more about the process, uh, you can uh, go to the link that is indicated below. This is the uh, very high level recipient country development strategy or country partnership strategy, we call it. This process is very critical. Why do we have to focus on this? where we're talking about TA because they're all related with one another. TA uh, should not be just a standalone project because uh, we have to start at the right place and it has to be a link to the follow-up projects. So there has to be a very close consultation process with the ADB. And CPS uh, will be developed through the collaborative process. So country partnership strategy or development plan that is to be developed. For example, uh, we used to have a five-year development plan. That is uh, what any country would do to drive their growth development. Uh, that plan has to be fully understood. And that has to be linked very closely with the poverty reduction goal strategy that is envisioned by ADB. And once that is understood, then there is a development cycle. For example, some country would have a rolling cycle of three year or five year. And within that time frame, Uh, how that strategy is going to be implemented, that has to be considered. And as a result, country partnership strategy will be formulated. And the recipient country would have to agree, basically. So it's a collaborative work. Of course, ADB will release this uh, document, but the development member country will have to first endorse the strategy that they, it's a collaborative document that there has to be a buy-in. And once there's an agreement, then ADB goes through the internal process and it is reported to the board for approval. 
So that is a first step in the process. Then here the slide talks about the objectives of um, OPS to first understand the challenges of the DMC. Then the ADB among the challenges tries to understand which priorities uh, the bank wants to focus on and how that is aligned to its own uh, corporate goals. Lastly, how it's going to make use of its limited resources. In that regard, uh, the CPS will be established. Once the CPS is formulated, that is a very high level document. And then you have to have an implementation action plan or a business plan. Then you come up with a COBP, which is a country operations business plan. Then technical assistance or project execution plan will be developed. Now, you have to have an alignment with the ADB corporate goal. There are seven pillars that prop up the um, ADB corporate goals. I'm not going to delve into every single one of them. There are, for example, responding to climate change. And basically, uh, we put a focus on poverty reduction, uh, regional connectivity, and so forth. There are seven pillars here. And among them, uh, it's number seven, operational priority which is regional cooperation and integration. Zooming on this, there are three uh, sub-level priorities and their operational approaches written down. There are also sub-pillars and projects related to this and the list here. And during the approval process, we are able to understand how the project uh, will be aligned to the goals. And then in the next slide. So uh, the CPS, it's a very thick document. And then when you go to the um, annex page, appendix page, the CPS will be evaluated against a certain framework. It's called results framework. Basically, there are a set of objectives for CPS. For example, boosting uh, competitiveness in the private sector. Let's say that that is a, an objective to be met. Then what are the uh, key strategic objectives? or priority areas, strengthening regional uh, connectivity, that's uh, op um, operational priority seven. Then you indicate that in the chart, and then you have to list up key outcomes. Then you list an outcome indicator. Then in addition to that, then you write down COBP, which is, which is a three-year ruling plan that an ADB, uh, well, it can be four-year, but it's usually a three-year ruling plan. Then a project will be list, listed up on a three-year ruling basis through consultation with a DMC, and the needs will be identified. So this particular area will become formalized. And the project will become very detailed. And whether it is a TA or project, that idea will become very crystallized. So here are the boxes I have marked. Housing, financial, inclusion. So. So that's the financial sector, that's a Central Asia public finance, that's an assistance name, 
the modality here is knowledge sharing assistance, technical assistance. Funding is technical assistance special fund, $800,000. And in the middle, the Korean government, E-Asia Knowledge Partnership Fund, that money will come from the Korea E-Asia Knowledge Partnership Fund. Preparing Comprehensive Transport Project. That is the um, Operation 7. So that is a project that is related directly to Operation 7. So this is a project that has to be implemented related to COBP. And you will see all of these projects for Pakistan. So you won't have any surprises here. Unless there are any exceptional cases. So no surprises on this um, COVP. So how to support a certain country? Because it is a document that is developed as a result of consultation with the donor. Um, ADB and the recipient country, then there's an agreement between the two, the country and the ADB, and then you embark on the implementation of the project. But before I talk about that, I would like to talk about ex post evaluation. This is a really critical uh, component. In order to conduct any assessment, it's very important to understand at the approval stage or in the approval stage the criteria for evaluating the effectiveness of a certain project. What key success factors would be? This is really critical for any project. So at the bottom, we call it a results chain. In order to uh, implement a project, there are inputs required, so financial inputs. Would there be technical assistance or, for example, $300,000 needed? What activities will be performed? by when, so there will be time frame or timeline defined, what will be the outputs to be achieved, what key indicators will be used to measure, what will be the data sources, and then you will define outcomes. And when you actually execute a project, And to achieve, um, and what you, what you will need to do to achieve uh, these goals. Now, I want, I want to share with you an example of a DMF. I think this is uh, from Pakistan. Fine letters here. I'm not sure whether you can really see this clearly. This is railway sector development. This is a document to be approved. If you go to the attached document, this is design and monitoring framework document. Again, this is part of the approval document. So you first start with impact. If it is a TA document, then you have to start with impact. But TA, of course, I mean, it's inherently for a TA to really take effect, it takes a long time. So we don't really begin with impact. 
So once the um, infrastructure project is completed, so when do we do performance evaluation? So usually from the completion of the project within 12 months, we do ex post evaluation. We have to do self-evaluation by the operational department. They do their own evaluation. So there are specific guidelines to be followed. And once that evaluation is submitted, then the ADB board, uh, they work on a no objection basis. So they don't really take it up for any discussion. The final approval will be made by the board. Unless there are any specific uh, directions given by the board, the information will be disclosed on the ADP website and the independent uh, evaluation department. The ID will conduct a validation on the report. The ID. They are not supervised under the management team. They report directly to the board, and this validated validation report is released uh, to the public after they go through the internal process. So there are four types of evaluations uh, conducted. So core criteria include relevance. Uh, was a project really relevant for the DMC? Uh, CPP and COPB will be evaluated whether it was um, aligned uh, with the country's development plan and was the uh, project really effective? Were there actual benefits or outcomes? And how about efficiency? Was it input and output? And was there sustainability? For example, let's say that there was a, a road a construction project. Construction is one thing and maintaining the road is another thing. So are there sustainable road maintenance policies in place? Was there evaluation conducted in advance. Or environmental impact assessment conducted. Uh, sustainability evaluation done. So evaluation results uh, will be shown in five different categories. Uh, highly successful, successful, less, less than successful, or unsuccessful. So I think one, two, three, four, five. Well, I think uh, the results could lead to constructive tension because the department's results and the evaluation departments um, actually could come up with uh, different results. In terms of effectiveness, efficiency, and sustainability, the evaluation departments may come up with different results. They have different, different evaluation outcomes. There could be differences in how they view the report outcomes. Then they would have to back up their arguments with evidence and justification. It becomes quite tense. So that actually brings me to the end of the presentation. But if I may go back to the front of the presentation. So again, these are some questions that I posed at the beginning of the presentation. Some useful questions again. What types of TAs you use in ADBs? Uh, when and how a TA is formulated? What guides the implementation of TAs? What are the key players and how TAs are evaluated? So this is uh, what guided my presentation. I'm not sure whether I've overrun my presentation. 
I think I need to just uh, deal with my last slide in the presentation. This TA, I told you that there is KSTA and TRTA. Uh, TRTA is quite similar to KSP. See, TRTA is very similar to what is supported by EDCF. But there are also limits, whether it is KSP or TRTA. It has objectives. And it needs to be linked to future follow-up projects. But again, there are limits uh, to uh, what TRTA can achieve. So that is why I decided to add this slide. TRTA mostly provides support for a feasibility study and preliminary engineering design and due diligence. For example, economic and financial analysis and social and environmental analysis. And whatever that is required by ADB. And uh, mostly support is provided on a grant basis, so it doesn't have to be paid back. And money comes from TASF or trust funds, so technical assistance, special funds. And it is mostly managed by ADB, the TRTA. And as for PRF or SEFF, that's project readiness finance or small uh, project facilities. So this is dealing with something that TRTA cannot do. For example, it deals with detailed engineering design. If you don't have detailed engineering design, then, for example, a uh, main uh, project really cannot be kicked off. In terms of project cost, there could be a lot of bottlenecks. And also due diligence support can be provided by PR, PRF and SEFF as, as well. And what's really different from TRTA is that loan uh, assistance is provided. So there has to be very a uh, strong commitment from the uh, DMC because it is a loan-based program, and the size is quite quite big. Uh, ADB member countries have made contributions as part of the ADB capital resource, so it's quite limited. But because it's a loan-based program, so anytime you can raise fund. So loan is dispersed, and PRF is managed by the DMC. The overall process will be supported by ADB, but the ownership lies in the DMC. And you can just read the uh, illustration in the slide below. And this concludes my presentation, and I will have a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. O. Oh. Thank you for the presentation. We have some pre-registered questions, and I would also like to deliver some questions from the online participants. So first question to you is that I understand that when a TA project is completed and put up for review, assessing its policy impact and doing so accurately may not be so easy. So are there any special know-how you can share? And given the nature of the TA project, it may take time for the project to really deliver its intended benefit. In other words, there could be a time lag. So when do you evaluate the project post-completion? Um, thank you. As for the case TA, 
I think that's a good question or relevant question for KSP because for TRTA, that is uh, connected to the follow-up project. So it is to be evaluated in the follow-up project. But for the KS KSTA, you may have a follow-up project. You may not necessarily have one. If it is a policy consultation TA, so it may not be so relevant to um, do the evaluation right away. So as I mentioned before, um, I talked about the DMF design and monitoring framework. The very top level starts with impact and then you have outcome. Underneath outcome, you have output and you have activities and inputs. Now you don't have impact here. That would be the answer to your question because when it comes to TA project, from the completion of the project, you have to do ex post evaluation within 12 months. But the outcomes, uh, because it is an impact, uh, you cannot really do the evaluation right away. But then you can do evaluation of the outcomes. And at the time of the um, approval, you have to be able to describe what the outcomes are. So within 12 months, you have to describe and you have to evaluate uh, what the outcomes. But as for the benefits, you may not be able to um, evaluate them within 12 months. So thank you for the detailed question. And then we have next question. So the TA project, um, do TA projects get performed only to ensure linkages to the main projects? I don't think I understand that question correctly. The TA projects that are performed by ADB, they're mostly transactional TAs. So they are linked to follow-up projects, but doesn't necessarily mean that there have to be follow-up projects for sector master plan TAs, the follow-up projects will come about at a later date. Just like what KSPs are doing. It may be, for example, an industry development project or institution. You may not have the follow-up project right away. The country partnership strategy that I talked about. What needs to be done between the ADB and the DMC that has to be that's identified. Now th then you have a COBP. So there's that understanding between the stakeholders. So that's how you go about doing the project. So it just comes as a result. So it's a lead up to the TA, how the TA is identified and explored. So it's a rationale for conducting a TA. I think you should approach it from that point of view. So from an offline and online, we're getting a lot of questions, but the, in the interest of time, I think we should just move on to the next presentation. So thank you very much. IDB. The second presentation will be provided by Mr. Antonio Garcia Zabalos, Communications Lead Specialist at Inter-American Development Bank, and the title is TCTAs by the IDB and Alignment with Loan Programs and Projects. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. For the opportunity to be here and share with you some of the thoughts that uh, we have as a, uh, as a development bank regarding the support that we have been receiving from Korea. The presentation that I'm going to give has the following title, Role of the IDB to Support the Digitalization in America Latina, in Latin America. So let me start by saying something that probably most of you already know. The situation provoked by COVID has had a lot of consequences in terms of digitization in the region. There are an increasing number of countries that are requesting the support from the bank in different aspects, in aspects related to development of uh, policies, uh, in aspects related to update of uh, regulatory frameworks, and of course, 
in aspects related to how to increase the availability of the digital infrastructure to get access to social services such as education, health, e-government services, but at the same time thinking forward what may be in the, in the post-pandemic period, thinking about the digital infrastructure as a catalyzer for productivity and competitiveness in the country. So the presentation that I'm going to give uh, is basically a structure in the following uh, five areas. As you can see in slide number two, we will be focusing first on what we do in my division, the division of connectivity, market and finance on this particular topic on digitalization and what are the type of projects that we are actually implementing with different countries. For, uh, later on, in section two, we'll be precisely presenting why Korea has become such a great partner, such an important partner for not only the bank, but more importantly for the region, uh, just to increase the level of digitalization and to increase the level of adoption by the different stakeholders. Then we will move on to uh, give you a, a brief uh, grasp on what are the different technical cooperations, knowledge sharing programs and financing projects that at this moment on time we do have and some of them, I have to say, with the enormous support that we are receiving from, the, uh, from Korea as well. And then I will uh, finalize with some final remarks after presenting a little bit the best cases uh, of the, the projects that we have been building together. So in slide number four, you can see exactly what is the role of the connectivity market and finance division in the digitization. I think that as a development bank, as you can understand, we are very much focused on providing support and assistance to the different countries in Latin America on this particular field of digitization. But at the same time, we are, as a bank, thinking how we can support financially all the efforts done by the different governments and the private sector to make sure that uh, the, the level of digitization become universal across the different countries. To do that, we have two separate windows. We have the public window and we have the private sector window. Me, myself, personally, are, uh, I mean, I'm personally working in the public side and in that particular regard, there are three main areas in which I'm actually working. First, we are providing technical assistance to the governments with the final objective of updating the policy and regulatory framework that eventually will foster competition and will foster investment by the private sector. To do that, there are four particular areas in which we are very much uh, providing support to the different governments. The first one is precisely the definition of national connectivity plans and how do they are related to digital agendas. We have a number of countries that are, that are precisely uh, designing digital agendas, but unfortunately they don't have national connectivity plans. I think uh, Korea uh, and the experience brought by, by Korean uh, um, uh, government and, and actions that you have been implemented between the public and the private sector could be uh, definitely a, a booster for uh, the region in the sense that it could establish this relationship between the digital infrastructure and the supply side of the equation as well as the demand side as a need to combine both of them together in order for the digital uh, needle to be moved. The second topic, of course, it has to be spectrum policy. I think that one of the key challenges that we are facing is that half of the spectrum that is available has not been allocated. So we are also providing a number of support in that particular field, as well on the topic of regulatory framework associated to infrastructure sharing. I think that because of the pandemic situation provoked by COVID, we realized that providing connectivity is not just about telecom infrastructure. It could be about how to use the electricity pipeline, the, uh, you know, the roads, even the, uh, uh, the train, in order for the, those particular internet services to reach out in a faster and more cost-efficient way the telecom services that they everybody should enjoy in order for the public service to be to remain continuous and last but not least universal service fund i think that there are a number of countries that they do have resources but the problem is again that there is a mismatching and a lack of relationship between the the, the use of the universal service fund 
and the national connectivity plan and the digital agenda. As you can imagine, there are huge amounts of challenges. Challenges in terms of regulations, challenges in terms of how to properly uh, organize uh, the, the different entities to make sure that there is this coordination and relationship uh, across the different entities. And of course, challenges in, in the sense of how to properly enforce that particular policy and establishes establish any sort of relationship between all of them just to move uh, ahead with the uh, digital transformation that the governments across Latin America are thinking of. So that is one piece of the work that we are actually doing. But of course, as a financing institution, we are also very much looking for providing financial support. In this particular field that I'm uh, particularly coordinating within the bank, we are precisely providing support to expand the digital infrastructure and upgrade the existing digital infrastructure around topics such as optical fiber with a international and a national basics. So it is not just about how to improve the connectivity of all those schools, the hospitals and, and public locations, but it's also about how to improve the interconnection across the different countries in such a way that we have more integrated, digitally integrated region. Of course, there are still countries where one third of the lines remain in 3G technology. So there is a lot of efforts that we had to do to migrate those users and those technologies from 3G to 4G and in the future to 5G. In addition to the basic uh, uh, digital infrastructure, we also had to think that there could be potential projects, projects uh, related to data centers that, as you see, you will see in a minute, is something that we are financing, but also some other uh, more innovative uh, models, such as uh, such as submarine cables, uh, cloud computing, or, uh, or even uh, satellite uh, uh, infrastructure. Last but not least, uh, in addition to the technical cooperation, the technical assistance, and the uh, financial support that we are providing, we are also helping the region in terms of the update of the uh, policy and regulatory framework. So for that particular uh, area of support, we do have what we call a policy-based loans that are precisely uh, you know, supporting the governments in upgrading, in, uh, you know, in updating the, uh, the policy uh, framework that they do have that eventually could uh, strengthen uh, not, so, not only the, the situation of the, of the uh, level playing field competition, but also encourage the level of investment by the different stakeholders. Following slide, and I'm slide number uh, five, we have the current projects. So the current project shows that we have already built very interesting uh, portfolio with uh, around more than 10 projects uh, around the same topics that, that I have been mentioning before. So we, we started working precisely with a co-financing program between the uh, ordinary capital from the IDV and the Korean infrastructure facility uh, back in 2015 in a project in Nicaragua of around 50 million distributed 25 from ordinary capital, 25 from KIF. And we continue with some other countries like uh, Paraguay, Honduras, Mexico, Guatemala, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Argentina, Ecuador, and again, Paraguay. So all this portfolio, I have to say, we build it together. It's something that is nothing but just the effort of the Korean government, the uh, upper management of the IDB, and the technical teams that has been working from both sides. So I can tell you, being very proud that the portfolio that we do have can, couldn't be possible with the support from the Korean government and the Korean institutions. As you will see, the strategy that we have been implemented uh, during the last uh, seven years is providing a particular return, is providing a payoff, is making the Latin America and the Caribbean be a more connected, a more digital, a more advanced uh, uh, region that is going to be prepared in a better way for the post-pandemic uh, situation. So you may ask why the IDV has been partnering so closely and so strongly with Korea. I mean, there is no any other better player, any other better uh, partner than Korea when it's about ICT and digital. 
everybody in Latin America and everybody here at the IDV knows that Korea is one of the fastest internet uh, infrastructure, is one of the uh, leading countries in terms of 5G, in terms of the innovative uh, digital economy, in terms of development of ICT indexes, in terms of e-government ranking, in terms of digital infrastructure, and of course, is, uh, you know, is having a, an impressive uh, portfolio of companies that are ready and are leading precisely the implementation of uh, different solutions at different levels uh, in, the, in the value chain of the digital services. So I couldn't think of uh, any better partner than Korea, and I cannot think of a better, uh, you know, a, a strategic alliance between the Korean institutions, the Korean government and the IDB to precisely make of Latin America a much more important region. And to do that, you know, we have been working together. And I'm very proud to say that. I am consider myself like one of you. I consider myself one person that has been working hand in hand with the Korean institutions, with the Korean secondsmen at the IDB and the Korean uh, uh, government uh, that has been supporting us around different topics in a very strategic way, in a very intelligent way. In such a case, by doing that, we were able to build up the portfolio that I was saying before and that I'm going to showcase uh, after. How is it that we came up in a situation like the one that we have now? So I think that the beauty of this strategic relationship comes from the fact that we have been using, in a very smart way, different channels. For one way, we have the Korean Trust Fund here at the IDV that has been pro uh, providing a strategic support on particular technical cooperations that eventually were the base and the ground for the uh, project related to feasibility studies, for project related to update and upgrade of a, a digital uh, a regulation a framework uh, related to that particular country and even the design of a specific um, uh, training courses, as, as it happened uh, back in 2013, when we established together the first training center for whole Latin America and the Caribbean. But these two instruments, the Korean Trust Fund and the uh, Korean Infrastructure Fund that has been instrumental to precisely leverage on the ordinary capital resources from the bank to increase the uh, amount of money that eventually we were lending together to the countries and also increase the level of impact wouldn't be possible without the KSP. The knowledge sharing program open up the window for future discussion with the governments and open up the window for in a very open and uh, you know uh, informal way I would say have a one-on-one -on -one discussion on key aspects that eventually lead to a, a potential financing by both the, by the government and by the IDV. So KSP, KTF, Korean Trust Fund, and KIF are three instruments that has been put at the disposal of the common goal, which is to precisely increase the level of digitization in Latin America and the Caribbean. You know, in addition to that, the bank and the region has been benefiting very much for all the interactions that we have had together, meaning all the discussions, the technical discussions that we have had with key leading institutions such as the Korea Internet and Security Agency, the National Information Society Agency, the Korea Information Society Development Institute, all of them contribute not only to the, to the level of understanding on the magnitude of the problem that the region was facing, but also allow us to work together to precisely define a roadmap for the implementation of specific recommendations and actions plans. So again, I'm very thankful for all those institutions and for all the support that we have been receiving for Korean Export Import, for uh, the MSAIT, for all these institutions I was mentioning, and of course, from the Ministry of Finance. But in addition to that, we cannot deny that Korea is one of the leading countries in the world when it's about private sector dedicated to digital infrastructure and digital uh, services and digital technology and digital equipment 
and everything that has to do with digital. I think that the experience that you are bringing in aspects such as 5G, smart cities, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, big data, IoTs are definitely something that are going to be very much useful, not only for the execution of all those pipelines, all those more than 10 projects that I was highlighting, but also for working together in the definition of strategic aspects that could eventually lead to a potential projects that we are going to be working together. So what are the type of uh, projects that we have been involved on the type of instruments that we have had? So in slide number 10, you can see that broadband technical corporations funded by the Korean Trust Fund has been instrumental. Those technical corporations, technical assistance that we have been giving to their countries and we have been working together, more than 33 technical corporations project associated to digital infrastructure has been a great support to make this portfolio really become what it is. Technical corporations has been devoted to aspects such as professionality studies that allow us to understand what is the infrastructure gap that the countries are facing, identify which is the amount of capex that is required in order for them to catch up with the average of the OECD countries, technical cooperations related to how to upgrade the telecom infrastructure and, and the telecom, uh, sorry, telecom regulatory framework. And in this particular regard, you have to keep in mind that two out of three countries in Latin America do have telecom regulations dating from 19, 1990s or early 2000s. So updating and upgrading that infrastructure becomes fundamental for the implementation of all those investment projects that eventually we have been working. But also technical cooperations related to the definition of a specific training programs that are increasing the capacity building of the officials to make sure that they do understand that by doing this policy reform and by doing these investment programs, they could improve the quality of life of their citizens and they could prepare their economy for the post-pandemic situation. Next is precisely the knowledge sharing program. And actually, the knowledge sharing program, as I was mentioning, implies to work from the very basic together to define exactly what are the key aspects, strategic aspects that eventually could be developed with technical cooperation and eventually through Korean Infrastructure Fund can be co-financed. Having KSP programs has uh, fulfilled a double objective. For one end, it positioned the bank in the region as a key player that understand the problems related to digitization and the problems related to particular aspects associated to digitization. Having KSPs on uh, aspects such as uh, uh, cloud computing, such as uh, big data, such as uh, mm, a re reduction of the uh, digital gap in rural areas, such as a, a project associated to artificial intelligence or critical infrastructure protections, has been instrumental to create first a discussion and understanding in the region about the importance of all those topics, and second, you know, to uh, open up the uh, table for particular debates on how the country can move forward in these particular aspects. The more than uh, 18 projects that we have been approved and executed since 2018 uh, speaks by themselves. And again, we are very much thankful for all this support. But the question here is that we were able to do the things in a way that somehow get together like glue, get together together in the sense that we were not doing knowledge sharing programs without having a continuation in a technical cooperation and without eventually having an open discussion about a potential loan, either in terms of uh, investment programs or in terms of um, uh, you know, policy-based loans. So the combination of three instruments, as I said, were critical, were fundamental to be able to get more than one billion dollars portfolio that we do have as of today and i'm sure that this portfolio is nothing but increase in the upcoming months 
due to the fact that everybody in the region understood about the importance of digitization, the importance of digital infrastructure, and the importance of having a sound regulatory framework for the post-pandemic situation and for the development of a sound uh, competitiveness and productivity in the country. So the combination of all these three aspects, as we will see in a minute, has been key and has proven to be instrumental for particular best cases. Let me start first in uh, slide number uh, 14 with the case of Nicaragua. Case one, in that particular project, we were working together to increase the broadband penetration in the country with the goal of contribution to the economic and social development of the country. To do that, we define together three particular factors or components. First, infrastructure, digital infrastructure. And this was the first project that, that we as a bank implement ever in the region in terms of digitization. And after that, we establish and we set up the basis for the project to come. Second, the update of the regulatory framework, taking into account, as I was mentioning, that many countries, especially in Central America, do have regulatory framework dating from late 1990s. And last but not least, the low capacity levels about how to properly use and get advantage from that digital infrastructure, from the connectivity to improve the quality of life. So in that particular project, we were working together with uh, particularly two uh, specific sectors, agriculture and uh, health. So the thing is that as I was mentioning, the combination of knowledge sharing program, technical cooperation, and Korean infrastructure fund were the key drivers to make the project become a success. In that particular case, we were working first on the national, on the definition of the national policies for fostering broadband applied to services for inclusive economic and social development. And then through a technical cooperation, we were working precisely in the update of the regulatory framework and the definition of the profitability study related to the infrastructure requirements that the country has in order for them to bridge the existing gap. Thanks to a specific loan program co-financed with the Korean Infrastructure Fund, we were able to define a $50 million program, as I said, first program uh, on digital infrastructure for the Inter-American Development Bank and first program financed by the Korean Infrastructure Fund, devoted specifically to broadband services. Second project is precisely one that has been recently approved. Precisely uh, uh, in the September 15, the Board of Directors of the IDB approved the project for El Salvador, another project that has been co-financed with Korea and that has the objective of increasing the access of, of the citizens of El Salvador to broadband services and increase its, increase its potential to provide continuity of, of public services. So that particular project is precisely focused very much on improving the connectivity of the schools and improving the connectivity of hospitals. In total, we expect to increase the connectivity of 2,205 public locations and, you know, work together to precisely uh, bring uh, to the different uh, citizens around the country the benefits of digitization and the benefits of remaining connected. That project, the same as it happened in the case of, uh, of Nicaragua, is focused on infrastructure, is focused on increasing the capacity uh, building and the digital skills of the different users, and is going to be supported by technical cooperation uh, coming from the Korean uh, uh, fund precisely devoted to improve their regulatory uh, weaknesses that the country is facing. But again, we were working together in a very coordinated and smart way. We started with a, a KSP program that was precisely related to the development of measurements and of measurements uh, of effective uh, deploy and, and project on ICT critical infrastructure. And then we continue with, uh, with a technical cooperation specifically devoted to support the country and support the execution of the program that eventually was approved uh, in mid-September by the Board of Directors. One program of $85 million co-financed by the uh, ordinary capital of the bank with 50 million and Korean infrastructure fund 35 million 
that is going to improve the access to connectivity for, a, a, you know, a, for the continuity of a public services. So, you know, I would like to end up this presentation by, again, saying thank you, thank you, thank you to Korea. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all the different institutions that has been involved. And thank you with uh, capital letters to all the great people that has been working hand in hand with the IDB to make this portfolio be what it is today. Nothing of the projects that we have been working on digitization and particularly on digital infrastructure would be happening today if not because of the uh, support that we have been receiving from you. So thank you very much and we are very much ready to what is coming after. I'm sure that the portfolio is going to increase. We are already having a lot of conversations with different governments, Bolivia, government from Paraguay, government from Jamaica, uh, government from Panama, and I'm sure that the portfolio is going to increase and I'm sure that the opportunity of partnering together is, is going to increase as well. So thank you very much, and see you soon. Take care. And Thank you very much. That was Mr. Antonio Garcia Zaballos. Uh, the IDB presentation uh, will not be uh, followed with the Q&A due to time constraints. Uh, those of you uh, that have any questions, please leave your questions in the chat room. We will make sure to deliver those questions to the speaker at a later point. Now, the last question, uh, excuse me, last presentation is on strategies for facilitating follow-up uh, projects of KSP, which will be delivered by Mr. Kwon Hyuk Jun, Director of KSP Team, Export and Import Bank of Korea. Please welcome the speaker with a big round of applause. Hello. My presentation will uh, cover strategies for facilitating follow-up projects of KSP. I'm Kwon Hyuk Jun, Director from the Export Import Bank of uh, uh, Korea, I'm, pl I'm very pleased to meet you today. So I will talk about the uh, strategies for facilitating follow-up projects of KSP. We've just heard uh, from the uh, two speakers from ADB and IDB. I will talk about what our bank is doing. And I will talk about what we need to do um, as a follow-up to the KSP, what we need to do to pull our wisdom together to provide a stronger support to uh, continue to work. Um, as was mentioned by Mr. O oh from um, ADB, my presentation will be dealing a lot with the methodologies. And those of you who are hearing uh, this topic for the first time, yeah, it may not be uh, very interesting. It may be very technical. So you can contact me after the presentation for further information and reference. My presentation will follow the proceedings. I will talk about the KSP, features of KSP, and KSP and follow-up projects, recommendations and suggestions what areas to support. And on Monday, through the Ministry of Economy and Finance, KSP uh, advancement strategy was announced, especially related to the follow-up projects. And I will share with you our suggestions. And lastly, I will talk about some case studies for follow-up and what support should be provided. KSP at a glance. Well, we are having a day three of the conference. I'm just going to give you a very brief look at the KSP. This is basically um, aimed at uh, sharing Korea's development experience with partner countries and providing customized policy consultation. Um, this is contributing to the uh, sustainable development of partner countries. Um, this is um, having the uh, involvement of the Ministry of uh, Economy and Finance together with uh, KDI, KXM, and COTRA. 
about 1,377 uh, projects have been implemented uh, since 2004. 87 countries have been involved in KSP projects thus far. So maybe my slides are in a different order, but um, OK. So let's now take a look at the uh, features or main characteristics of KSP from the point of uh, SWOT analysis. So what are the strengths of KSP? What are the opportunities? So that enables a follow-up project to be implemented. First of all, what is the biggest strength? It is that the project is tailored to the needs of the partner country based on development experience of Korea in offering customized policy consultation. So that enables uh, concessional loans, EDCF, uh, to be matched easily to the program. So that enables linkage to concessional loans. And from the opportunity side, uh, especially the government is very much focusing on the importance on combining um, ODA project and KSP uh, is a, a leading grant-based project. And it can be linked uh, very actively with um, loan-based projects. And when we have uh, good project ideas, then we can implement uh, these different ideas for follow-up uh, projects. We do offer a lot of TA, uh, TC projects, especially av available at the um, MDPs. This is a comparison uh, between KSP and TA and TC. For example, KSP uh, basically provides knowledge support type of policy consultations. Uh, many KSP uh, TAs are focused on improving institutions and systems. There have been a lot of large-scale uh, projects for institutional building. There's a lot of increasing demands from the development, uh, developing countries. Uh, uh, Pre-FS and a lot of feasibility study uh, KSPs are in order. And ADB also explain about transactional TAs and TCs. Many KSPs uh, that are implemented are quite similar in nature. KSPs are different from MDB TCs and TAs because they're all about sharing Korea's development experience. Various stakeholders such as KDI and COTRA with a development experience, and KXM that offers EDCF. These stakeholders are direct, not always directly involved in the um, implementation of the project. We hire consultants from the Korean market as well as local um, consultants. So we can tap into a lot of expertise. We tap into a co-consulting cool project in collaboration with MDBs. This slide. I think is uh, was shown by Dr. O before. This is a project a process of an MDB because they first identify a project. Before they do that, uh, they would define a project strategy or a country partnership strategy for an ADB. 
in consultation with a partner country. And afterwards, pipeline project uh, would be identified in consultation and a specific process will be followed. So why are follow-up follow projects so significant? So it's doing more than what is given. So you don't just stop with developing a strategy. You try to drive a real cha change and innovation. And you try to widen opportunities for your local, for your own companies. That is what um, Kutra is doing. For example, we're trying to involve uh, private sector companies and KSP programs uh, are currently being implemented so that private sector companies are now proposing ideas. And that is going to widen opportunities for uh, private sector companies to be involved in the project pipelines from the from the start. Um, so this is a history of KSP and how KSPs have been translated into follow-up projects. This was also presented by ADB. So when you do, for example, KSP. It doesn't necessarily mean that KSPs are going to be uh, connected to follow-up projects all the time. As was mentioned by uh, IDB, like in the case of Nicaragua, when you're implementing a, a broadband project, uh, in 2013, we had a KSP project. And we talked about KTF, and there was an EDCF co-financing commitment made and in 2016 and 2017 the broadband uh, program was supported with uh, advi advice and consulting and we had a follow-up project to that effect so there was a smooth flow of support and in the case of Egypt in 2013, we had a KSP for electronic il interlocking system for ra ra railway system. It was a feasibility study KSP and EDCF support was provided. And in 2014, together with uh, World Bank, financial commitment was made and in recently, KXM tapped into EDPF combined with EDCF financial support was given. Lastly, uh, taking an example of Kenya, uh, we had an African regional seminar. I think Kenya case was mentioned very extensively. 5 million population in Kenya. Of course, there's a transportation infrastructure issue. There are a lot of people that are commuting on C CBD, a lot of uh, Russia issue, commuting problems. There was a KSP project done to come up with an ITS, intelligent transport system, and the traffic control system. And two KSPs were conducted, the BRT to deal with the bottleneck issue, and Nairobi ITS a project with EDCS support, EDCF loan project, MD, uh, MDB co-financing project uh, was conducted. Now, from this point on, 
What I will talk about is some set of suggestions as to how to go about KSPs. Now, the government released a plan for um, upgrading KSPs to deliver better outcomes, how to improve KSPs going forward. KSP plus an upgraded version will be implemented. So how can we do KSP better? We should start from the selection phase with partner countries and with MDBs. We need to start from the selection consultation phase from a different approach. We need to first have a better understanding about the strategy of a partner country. We need to understand their financial uh, priorities, their fiscal standing, so that we can we don't have to um, waste time. We can come up with uh, more suitable project ideas. And we can connect them better to financing and KSP steering committee will be making the final decisions and uh, we will be looking at the commitment on the part of the DMC and for those viable projects and ideas And we will have to select those um, projects with high willingness to utilize those loans. Now, some suggestions for the implementation stage. If you look at the historic KSPs, most of the KSPs were dealing with just sharing Korea's development experience and analyzing development gaps in DMCs. However, not really making specific development proposals or policy options. As a person that has implemented, implemented KSP projects on a number of occasions, perhaps it is because of the limited budget and limited manpower, and especially last year and this year due to the COVID 19 pandemic, uh, fact-finding mission was quite limited. I think there were a lot of uh, realist, uh, practical issues to be addressed. However, going forward, I think uh, various issues that we have en encountered thus far would be resolved. I really believe that we have to go beyond uh, just offering some rough ideas. Uh, we have to work more closely uh, with implementing agencies and make our ideas more concrete and make sure to translate them into feasibility studies and also evolve, translate them into concept papers and concept ideas. And to do that with the DMC and MDBs, consultation and collaboration would be critical. So I've shared with you our suggestions for KSP upgrades. So in order to ensure a linkage to EDCF, how can we ensure better delivery? Again, I've uh, mentioned issues in terms of KSP just being uh, making proposals.
I think there's really a need to improving the design aspects of the projects. And I think we really have to improve our work in terms of making our follow-up uh, project ideas more robust. Once we have those project ideas, more concrete project ideas, we can uh, take them further by, for example, connecting them to um, EDCF uh, pipelines. KSP uh, could serve as a, a very effective foundation. And it is really beneficial in terms of uh, building capacity in DMC. There are other organizations such as COICA and other ODA institutions. So that is, it is really essential that we work closely with these ODA institutions. So this photo here shows our governor and the Korean Foundation for Health, International Health signing an MOU for collaboration. So we have these regular meetings for collaboration with relevant stakeholders to improve our sector-specific expertise. Uh, sometimes we dispatch our PMCs because when we do KSPs in certain countries, we have needs for obtaining data and information and we need to work with other organizations. And by working with others, we can improve our own capacity. Thus far, I've talked a lot about methodologies. Before I close, I'm going to share some case studies. First case study is a Center for D Disease Control in Cam Cambodia. It's a CDC in short. This was not a KSP project. But Kofi, uh, Korea Foundation for International Health. It was a collaboration with EDCF in the COVID-19 situation. EDCF uh, emergency loan was given to Cambodia and Kofi had a capacity building project in Cambodia and had a technical cooperation project. And feasibility study project was conducted and as a follow-up program, EDCF uh, is going to provide some support for the operation of CDC and capacity building uh, project will also be conducted in parallel. This is, again, not a KSP project, but the reason I'm citing this as an example be is because KSP also had similar project. Now, KXM in Ethiopia and Paraguay had a project for infectious disease control and prevention system And I think Kofi could play a role of a KSP uh, implementation agency. Similar applications were received. Next year, FS project will be completed. And the, uh, the, the pressure facility, pressure control facility uh, will be completed in the region. And that is why I wanted to uh, cite this um, example from the, the construction of the Center for Disease Control in Cambodia. Next is Honduras. 
this is to design a smart city strategy for La Ceiba. On day one of the conference, the PI uh, came up to deliver a presentation. Uh, the panelists also uh, shared their ideas about the follow-up project. Some detailed ideas were shared. project concept paper has been proposed as well. So panelists um, also, one of the panelists also shared uh, the hope for making the uh, project ideas more sustainable. I think that this uh, project idea could really serve as a, a best practice. Uh, this project was implemented by uh, Samsung SDI. Private sector company was involved in developing a, a strategy, the design strategy for a smart city. It was an implementing body for KSP. Especially, I think we can use this um, as a model for um, expanding the involvement of private sector companies. The La Ceiba company, uh, country, the city is a tourist city that is located at the uh, coastline of Honduras, but it has a very insufficient infrastructure in terms of road transportation. Uh, public security is very poor, uh, disorganized infrastructure. To address these infrastructure issues, Jeju City and those very strong tourist cities uh, were their case examples were used as a benchmark for KSP and KSP consultants share their models. Some 18 implementation uh, methods were developed, three of which were selected for FS project concept, concept papers were identified as tasks and tasks have been completed to date. And Honduras Ministry of Finance uh, is now reviewing the uh, feasibility study task. And when that's done, and when that is implemented into a project, and I think we can link that to a follow-up project. And I wanted to introduce this project because uh, it is a very good story to share. So if I may summarize, my example, so KSP has been in place for about 17 years since 2004. About 1,400 projects have been implemented to date. There have been a lot of successes, but some limits as well. And to overcome such limitations in the first half of this year, the government uh, is now strengthening its consultation process with implementation bodies to strengthen the follow-up project process. So the upgrade strategy has been released. Going forward, I think there will be a lot of changes in the K KSP implementation. I, I think it's going to be dealt with in the COTRA session. The EIPP, the sister program, will be introduced. This is very similar. Case, for example, KSP can be done over years, over two to three years, and policy consultation can really be provided over a longer extended period of time, can provide depth to a country. Again, I wanted to share with you uh, some suggestions for improving the linkage uh, rate to follow up uh, projects 
because we want to first uh, make our projects more concrete and we want to uh, spend we want to be able to spend more time with the uh, development partner country in the pre preparation phase and uh, link our project with the MDBs and deliver the outcomes to other stakeholders and also work with other ODA institutions and other knowledge consulting agencies and like the last case example last Eva we also must engage private companies where they were involved from the front end of the process if they can be involved from the project ideation phase we can really make a lot of success stories thank you very much i would like to conclude my presentation with that that was Mr. Kwan. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to present questions to you, and I will also like to convey questions from the online and offline participants. First question When identifying potential K KSP projects, are there any specific areas that you're considering? If you can just make your uh, responses very brief. So for KSP projects, there are three stakeholders involved in providing assistance. So anything is possible. We don't really say something is possible and something is not possible. But for example, K, uh, for KXM, if you look at the topics, green and digital areas where we're emphasizing and we especially focus on health area, public health, green area, green uh, smart city like we saw with the Honduras case and waste management waste management or El Salvador um, education management system or Costa Rica's public procurement e-government there are a lot of demands and needs for that and green digital health related topics I think should continue into the future I think that's where we want to focus on in providing our support I think that's something to be considered next year another question once the KSP project is completed how do you manage the partner countries requests and development demands identified during the uh, specific topic phase of the KSP project how do you follow up on the partners requests and demands that is a very relevant question in terms of implementing a follow-up project I think that is a very critical question indeed once a KSP project comes to a close, many projects just stop at that. It is very important to, however, continue that into another series of questions. And we need to have a pool of candidate questions. We need to continue to update that and to have a pipeline of questions have a list of candidate questions and we need to have a process for that so developing a, a list of projects would be important and if we can do that and if we can cooperate with MDBs on that to improve our sector knowledge and to refine our knowledge for the specific region I think it would go a long way towards improving our work in that space. So thank you very much from online and offline uh, participants. We're getting a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, we would have to end our Q&A at that point. Thank you very much. And if you have any further questions, please be sure to leave your question in the chat room. Thank you very much. So this is the end of the Q&A session. Once again, I'd like to express my thanks to the three presenters from the three organizations. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentations. 
With this, we would like to conclude the session on follow-up projects and future development strategies of KSP. I hope that this was an opportunity for many experts and practitioners to gain insights and share experiences. For the past three days, we have had the 2021 KSP Dissemination Conference, both online and offline. Thank you very much for your active participation. I hope to be able to see you again next year with a better program. And it has been Park Se-eun from Korean Exim Bank. Thank you very much.